This week for EM and 5, we're going to talk about electrical injuries. And one big thing for this is to remember that just what you see on the surface doesn't represent the extent of damage on the inside. You actually need to think about the route that the electricity and the current took. So when a person gets electrocuted, uh, there's usually a source that they're touching, and that's going to be the entrance of the current, and that usually creates some kind of entrance wound, for example, on the hand. And then the current is going to go out where the person is grounded. So it's usually the feet, if the person has their feet on the ground, and that's going to create an exit wound. Although it can be elsewhere. Here's an example of a person who touched a live wire with the right hand but was leaning on a metal rail with the left forearm. So here you can see the entrance wound on the hand and the exit wound on the arm. So it's important to think about where the entrance was and where the grounding was in order to think about the route that the current took. Now as the current goes through the body, the structures that are most injured are going to be the things that conduct very well. And those are going to be things with high fluids and a lot of electrolytes. So these are the things that are hurt the most. The nerves, which their whole job is to conduct, right? So they're going to be hurt the most. Also think about blood vessels, which have a lot of fluid in them and muscles. And then lastly, the skin is a little on the edge. If it's not wet, it actually does not conduct very well. But if the person's out in the rain or is sweaty, then it conducts very well. Now there's tons of different organ systems in the body that can get injured from an electric shock. In neuro, you can have seizures, cerebral edema, stroke, cord injuries. Cardiac is a big one. You can get V-fib or rest, arrhythmias. For the lungs, you can get contusions and edema or even tetany that can cause respiratory arrest. The GI tract can get perforation, necrosis, hemorrhage. The vascular system can turn into a pretty big mess, a lot of thrombosis, coagulation. Muscles, you can get tetany, necrosis, a lot of dislocation and fractures if the person is thrown or burns. The eyes, interestingly enough, you can get corneal burns and retinal detachment. Okay, so you see there's a lot of different things going on, but some of these things take some time for the injury to actually present itself. So in the emergency room or EMS transport, I wanted to highlight three things that are pretty life-threatening up front that we can help prevent or treat. So number one, cardiac arrest. Electric shocks can cause V-fib, sometimes asystole. V-fib is nicer for us because we can shock the person. So if they're having cardiac arrest, make sure and shock them. Number two, they can get a respiratory arrest. This can either be central from a brain injury or peripheral, meaning they're having a significant tetany, so a muscle spasm in the chest wall that actually prevents them from taking a breath. So make sure and bag them as needed. And third, you can get massive muscle breakdown from all that tissue injury. A couple things that can lead to rhabdomyolysis leading to renal failure and also a lot of electrolyte abnormalities that can make them at higher risk for arrhythmias. So as we're transporting them and seeing them in the ER, make sure and give them a good amount of fluids to help prevent this and reduce the effects. So there's two types of current that we see patients getting injured from. AC, the alternating current, which is standard electrical socket, and then batteries, which are DC current. Now AC current tends to be worse. This is because it causes really bad explosive exit wounds and then also this phenomenon called flexor tetany. So this is where the current actually causes the muscles to spasm in a flexor manner, which means that they hold on to whatever they're holding on to even tighter and they can't let go. So this leads to prolonged exposure to the current and even more injury. And lastly, if it's going to cause an arrhythmia, it tends to cause a V-fib arrest. Now, direct current tends to have smaller exit wounds, doesn't have the flexor tetany. However, if they do have an arrest, it tends to be more asystole, which is worse for the patient because you can't shock them. So as far as voltage, a standard U.S. outlet, it's only about 120. Um, it can cause injury still, but it's not nearly as bad as power lines, for example, which are 7,000, much higher. Now, one thing to think about in cities that have subways or any kind of electric rail uh, those are actually pretty high. They can be up to greater than 600 volts. And anything that more is going to be worse, obviously. But usually we draw the line of kind of high voltage injuries somewhere greater than 600 volts. That just means that they're going to be at higher risk for worsening damage, higher mortality, and probably need to observe them longer in the emergency room. And this is why downed power lines are especially harmful for patients, and we tend to see most of the deaths with power line injuries. Just as a quick little fun quiz here, we've all had a static shock. How many volts do you think a static shock is? Well, interestingly enough, it's really high. It's 20,000 volts. Now, why are we not all dead from this? Well, it's because the amount of charge is very low. So unlike an electrical socket or a power line, which has unlimited charge, with a static shock, we're grounding that charge instantly so it doesn't really cause any harm. That is, unless there's something that could ignite that charge nearby, then it can cause problem. One quick mention that if you're responding to a scene in which you're doing a start triage method, you actually want to address the patients who are black or in arrest first, because if you can shock them, they have very good outcomes of survival. Whereas the other patients, if they're walking and talking, they probably don't have injuries that are going to be immediately life-threatening. 
Okay, so let's review. Always think about the entry and exit wounds and the route it had to take to get there. Three life-threatening injuries to address are cardiac arrest, particularly V-fib arrest, respiratory arrest, and also muscle breakdown, so make sure and give the patient fluids. And make sure that when you're on the scene, think about the dangers to yourself and your crew and keep everyone safe. Thanks for joining us on this week's EMN5.